Hello, hello. Welcome. Good Tuesday night, everybody. Good Tuesday night. Good to see you getting on the scope. Been, I want to say it's been a minute, but I forgot that I scoped on Sunday. I scoped um, the preached message, the preached word on Sunday. Thank you for joining me. Those of you who were able to be on the scope, thank you for the hearts. Bless you tonight. I'm excited about this word. It is a heavy word, um, and but I want to share it with you. I believe that it's the time and season to do so. Um, this is a good opportunity to uh, discuss the office of the pastor. Uh, we've been hearing much much, much, much about the office of the prophet. And this is an opportunity to talk about the office of the pastor. Um, and so uh, as you guys are getting on, let me know who you are. Let me know where you're from. Please feel free to invite your followers. This will be a taught word. This will not be a personal rant about the pastors. This will not be, and it will be a balanced word, I promise you. Uh, so please feel free to invite uh, your followers. Hey, James from Austin, that's my husband. Uh, good to see you on. Thank you, honey. Hey, Erica. Hey, bestie. Good to see you. Yes, Bettina. You know, he's <laughs> my husband. He is special. Bless you, God. He is, he's, he's special to the Lord. Good to see you, Ty. Bless you for being on tonight. And thank you for the confirmation of this word. Uh, thank you, Erica, for inviting your followers as well. Um, I thank you for those of you who are still getting on. Let me know if you're first timers. Good to see you to Ty. Um, I'm not going to belabor the time. I'm going to wait a couple of seconds, but let me share with you. Um, I posted it on my Facebook page, but not all of you obviously are my Facebook followers or connected with me on Facebook. Um, but the other morning, as I was praying in the morning, the Lord began to speak to me and literally my tongues change. There's a, a sound that happens when um, it's not of you. It is not your own personal prayer languages. It's truly the spirit of God beginning to prophesy on the inside of you. And I really wish that I had turned on my recorder because my tongues changed, the sound changed and it became a sound of war. And I begin to prophesy out loud and the God began to give me revelation and he gave me words for my spiritual father and I shared it with him. And then he began to show me some things about Austin in particular. And he began to show me that in the atmosphere over this city, over Austin, Texas, that he was beginning to pierce the sky, that the sky was going to be split apart, that literally a sword would be coming down into the earth right in the middle of Austin. And the Lord was saying that he sees the, the lifted hands of his people. He hears their cries. He sees that their hearts are being lifted up in this season and they're asking him to come. And because they're asking him to come and because their arms are lifted in surrender, that this lightning bolt as a thunder thunderbolt would come and hit the earth right in the center and it would shake everything and so um, that just began to impress upon me more and more but this word about the pastors and for the office of the pastor has been resting upon me for the last couple of weeks the Lord has been talking to me one about his church and we understand that church is not the building that we go to on Sundays and Wednesdays and Saturdays and all the days that we go it, that is great that's a wonderful thing but the ecclesia is us the body of God we are the church you as an individual you are the tabernacle of God you are where he resides you are Bethel where God resides on the inside of you you are the church the foundation that he is most interested in is not your building it is not your church edifice it is not your temple where you go it is you it is you the body of God he's interested in you as a temple and so as God began to talk to me about his church, I, re I really believe that that was the word he was going to have me preach this past Sunday, but he changed it and, and he set that aside. And I believe that is for a further study for me. But in the midst of that time period, he began to talk to me about pastors. Now, I walk in the office of a pastor. Now, let me clarify for you. Let me let me give a little foundational understanding. When we see people who flow in the prophetic, we see people who have an apostolic grace, we see those who are empowered to do great and mighty things, who walk in miracle signs and wonders, sometimes we want to, to give them a higher office. We want to say, oh no, you can't be just a teacher. Oh no, you can't be just a pastor. You must be this or you must be that. But truly God has placed each and every individual into a particular 
office. Now listen, I'm not saying that everybody who is saved and a believer has been given an office. Now I'm not saying that, so don't assume that because you're a believer automatically you have some office. There are many gifts, we are a many-membered body, and there are many gifts and many things that God needs each and every one of us to accomplish. Some of you have the gift of giving. Some of you have the ministry of helps. Some of you have the gift of exhortation and the ministry of exhortation. Not everybody has an office, but please understand me when I say that Jesus himself was so powerful and so mighty that he had to parcel himself off in five gifts. Are you hearing me? In five offices. Jesus was so mighty that he could not be consumed. He could not be assumed. He could not be surrounded by one office alone. Literally, he had to parcel himself out in five offices. That is why we have the fivefold gifts. Now listen to me. The fivefold offices work together. They work in unison. They work together. It creates harmony. It creates tranquility in the body. Now listen to me. It creates tranquility in the body. So when one is missing, then we're off balance. Are you hearing me? So when you're in a, ho a house and the house says, oh no, all we have room for is the pastor. There are no other offices in this in this church. Then the, then the body has no guidance. And there's a prophetic word that guides uh, God's people. The prophetic word guides, right? If there's no apostolic covering, no apostolic push, no apostolic revelation, then there is no governing that's missing. Are you hearing me? And, and if for some reason we say, I'm just going to be the pastor and the teacher. And at the end of the day, God has not endowed me with the great strength of the teaching ability. Then people don't learn. They don't grow. Are you hearing me? And then how are you going to gather them in as the evangelist? Each and every offices all five, all five together, all of them must be together. Are you hearing me? They must be together. We cannot have one without the other. Listen to me. I'm saying, yes, in some houses, you just have one or the other. But I pray for apostolic covering. I pray that they're connected to an evangelist in their city. I pray that they're connected to a, a prophetic voice that can help them come in seasonally and speak what God is saying in a season. God created us to be fitly joined together fitly joined together. So I'm going to just put that caveat out there before I begin to share this true indictment to the office of the pastor. It is an indictment and it's coming from the Lord. Now weigh it out. I always tell people, check my fruit, weigh it out. And you hear if God is saying the same thing to you, but I'm, but I wanted to just establish that because I'm not saying we're getting rid of any of these offices. I am proud and blessed by God to be called as a pastor. Now, yes, I flow in the prophetic. That is a gift that God has given me. Yes, God has given me the teaching gift. I believe that that's also an office I walk in. Yes, the apostolic rest upon me. But at the end of the day, when God first spoke to me, he called me a shepherd. And he's given me that charge. And so for those of you who are pastors, who God has called you into the office of the pastor, stop shirking your duty. Stop passing it off for a higher office. Stop saying, oh no, everybody's an apostle now. I don't really want to be a pastor anymore. I need to be an apostle. Listen, I'm telling you that the sheep have now gone astray. The sheep have been let out of the gate. The gate is no longer being guarded and protected. And it's our fault. It's our fault. So I'm speaking to the pastors. I bless those of you who are in any other gift who are on here right now. That's great. But I pray that we pass this off, that you share this with your pastor friends, that you pass it on, that you make sure that they get it, that they hear it. And I pray that God convicts them where it needs to be conviction. And if God confirms in them what they're doing, then may it confirm them. But it's God's word that cuts between flesh and spirit. He makes the difference and he makes up our understanding. It's not about us. It's not about us to, to, to look and see and to understand, but God will, he'll, he'll reveal where we need to come in alignment. And so I'm sharing this word with you tonight for the pastor. Amen. Okay. So. Here we go. Uh, let me start by praying first. I've already gotten into a flow. Father, we thank you right now. We, your people, give you praise and we give you glory. Lord, we lift you up. We give you adoration. We give you our love and our sacrifice, God, which is our bodies. Lord, we give it to you, holy and acceptable, this living sacrifice. And Father, we pray right now, Lord, that your people would come together, Lord, that we would align ourselves with you, God. Lord, that we would be endued with power on high.
why and God the grace gift that you've given us God that we would walk it out with power and authority God that the fire of your anointing would be upon us God that miracles signs and wonders will follow us because we believe and not only because we believe but because we walk it out for first Thessalonians 5 it tells us that the gospel did not come in word alone but it came in power it came in Holy Spirit and it came with full conviction so father we're expecting this year to see miracles signs and wonders we expect it in Jesus name so we bless you now may the word go forth may it do what you've called it to do for you said your word would not return unto you void I bless your people in the name of Jesus we're expecting something now in Jesus name amen amen yes we walk out our salvation and so Let's start with the beginning. What is one of the major tasks that we know that pastors are responsible for? Now, let me get, let me help you with this. Here's a, a, a small understanding. A pastor is a shepherd. So the office is called a pastor. When the Lord uh, descended and he ascended, he left these offices in place. The office is a pastor. But the gift, listen, the gift, the grace to do, the grace to do, when we hear gift, right, when we hear charisma, when we hear that, the gift that God has given you, it is to shepherd. The gift of a pastor is not pastoring, it is shepherding. It's a responsibility for the sheep. And we can go and, and go to J uh, John 21, 15, 17. How many of you have seen the movie Risen already? How many of you? Please go see the movie Risen. I recommend it highly. Please go see it. John 21, 15 through 17. We know this very well. It is the restoration of Peter from Jesus who comes back. He's already been resurrected and he comes and he sees Peter and he takes him aside and he restores him back. The three times that, that Peter denied him, the Lord asks him three times, do you love me? Then feed my sheep, right? Then do you love me? Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Then take care of my sheep. He gave him the responsibility to shepherd. Are you hearing me? There are many of you that are shepherds that don't walk in the office. Now that's okay. Listen, the gift of shepherding could be on many of you, but that did not mean that God set you in an office as a pastor, giving you authority, authority. There comes something within those offices of judgment and correction. I believe it's an apostolic gift to tear down and root up, to build up. There, there's something in the offices that authority rests upon the office. So you could be a shepherd in a house where you're training up the young people or you're over the music ministry and you're shepherding the music ministry. But the office is something different. The office is something different. There is a supernatural endowment from the Lord to shepherd the sheep in the way that a pastor does. He, he, he or she has been given great oversight, great revelation from the Lord for what they're called to do. If you are called as a pastor, your heart will bleed for the sheep. And in my case, God is building within me the ministry that is going to be planted. But for years, I would lay on my floor in the middle of the night and cry for people I did not know. Far places I had never been and I would weep for them and I would weep for the fact that they were not being fed, not being clothed, not being sheltered and had no one to go to. Now, the major primary role of a pastor is to guard. They guard the sheep in the process of guarding. This also means we're guarding your soul, which means my responsibility is not to take those 10 minors that, you know, that the Lord has given me and put it under a bushel. It's to give the Lord a return on his investment. When the Lord has called you to the kingdom, those who are, who are sheep, those who've been called to the kingdom, the believer, when God has given you right to a ministry, to a house, that pastor's responsibility is to give God an investment, a return on it. So God has given that to them they're not to give that person back the same way they're to help that person to expand increase and grow to be nurtured to feel free to be clean to be fed to be watered to be sheared are you hearing me there's a responsibility on the pastor to do some work now we know the perfect example of all these fivefold offices listen the first responsibility of all of them is to be a servant am i right Jesus was the perfect servant in every area. He went first. He washed their feet first. He sacrificed.
sacrificed himself, his body, physical body, and died first. He was the best example. And literally, that is what the Lord is expecting from us pastors. Go first. Stop expecting your sheep to prop you up and do stuff for you. What have you done for them lately? What have you done? Have you expected something without sowing in something? And I, I just see, I just see pastors off their post. They're off their post. It's, it's turning into a business. It's turning into a business. And let me tell you, capitalism and the kingdom have nothing to do with each other. Nothing to do with each other. Capitalism and, and the kingdom don't speak the same language. Are you hearing me? So if we're concerned about lucre, which is money. If that is our main source for what we're doing for the Lord, then we've lost it already. Our priorities are off. Now, you may say she's just talking. I haven't really heard her uh, give me some scriptures. Oh, I'm going to give you some. We talked about feeding my sheep. Let's talk about Ezekiel. I'm taking you to the Old Testament. And this is what the Lord is speaking now, right now. Now, listen, we read the Old Testament and some people say, oh, that's that's so past when Jesus came. Uh, you know, he abolished everything. And now we're in the New Testament. He said he did not come right to abolish the law, to bypass the law, to cut away the law. Didn't he say he came to fulfill the law? He came to fulfill it. He came to embody what was said before. So we're going to Ezekiel to understand what was spoken first about the shepherds. And the Lord is speaking this even now. It says prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. There's this prophecy that comes forth. Ezekiel 34 and 1 through 10. And it says, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, but I really love the New Life Version as well. Uh, make sure you're reading in different translations so you can see them together. Literally, I'll show you. I have, if you can see this kind of, I have it parallel so I can read both at the same time. And in the New Living Version, I think I'll just read that one instead. It says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man. Now, son of man um, is also used, uh, uh, son of man is also used for holy man. It's also used as prophet. So if you're a prophet, they tend to call them son of man. So son of man, meaning Ezekiel, speak against the shepherds of Israel. Now, you may say, well, you know, we're not really. Yes, we are. We are Hebrew. We are Israelites. We are from, we are grafted in and this is our lineage so speak against them it says speak in my name and tell those shepherds the Lord God says it is bad for the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves listen it says should not the shepherds feed the flock and so what this is talking about is that shepherds have gotten fat they've gotten fat on the word they've gotten fat on expectation when I come in I expect you to do this I expect a certain amount of money and your tithes was low this week and you know and I know you sick in the hospital but let me look at the tithing record first to determine if we gonna send somebody to see you wait a minute I know that your lights got turned out and perhaps you don't have any food you need to pray more so, you know, this is saying you have shirked your responsibility. You as a shepherd, one of your main tasks is to feed the sheep. We saw that at John 21. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. It says take care of the sheep. And so what we're finding here is that in verse 2, the Lord is saying you've been feeding yourself. You've not been shepherding my flock. He says you eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool. Basically, what they're doing is, I'm going to say it like this, I have to say they're raping the sheep now some of this is happening in the natural some of this is physically raping the sheep we we understand that but some of it is about stealing and taking from them i'm taking your wool now listen wool represents warmth it represents warmth and protection the sheep need the wool in the winter to stay warm and if i'm taking the warmth from you i'm taking the fat from the sheep. I'm taking the thing that keeps you protected from the cold weather. I'm taking it. And that's what this is saying. It says you kill the fat sheep without feeding the flock. So I'm killing the sheep that are fat to feed me and my family, making sure that we're okay. It reminds me of a pastor who came to a city. He moved there and only had a couple of members. And he said, I'm not going to work. He had a wife and two kids. And he says, yes, because the ministry is going to take care of us. And, and I'm thinking, you just planted a ministry. You got 3.5 members. 
and you know, and this is not including his family. So 3.5 members and you're going to use all the money that they give you to live. Are you serious? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Are you with like literally for real? Are you, are you, are you, are you serious? So you expect the ministry to handle the weight of your family, meaning your house, your food, your clothing, your gas. Excuse me? Really? So no wisdom here. No wisdom. There needs to be balance. You know, there needs to be balance. I truly believe that. And don't worry, I'm going to, for those of who pastors who are saying, well, some people don't take care of their, their, their pastors. We're going to get to that. But right now, let me get, let's get this indictment out. I think oftentimes we want to, throw it off and say, yes, but my people weren't good to me. Yes, but there's some people who left my ministry. Yes, there's some people who stabbed me in the back. Yes, maybe that happened too. But right now the indictment is on the pastors. To whom much is given, I don't need to finish it because you know the end of that. So God is requiring greater and much more out of those who he set in office. There's a greater call and a greater responsibility and God is going to ask for what he's given you back. He's going to measure so we say in verse four, it says, you have not given strength to the weak ones. You have not healed the sick. Listen, you have not helped the ones that are hurt. This breaks my heart. You have not brought back those who have gone away. And we know Jesus, the perfect example, is the one who will go. He's the shepherd who will go after the one. I can have 50 sheep, 50 million, but the one that is lost, I will go and I will find you. I will search you out. I will pin the other ones in so that they're safe. And I will go on days and weeks and months month's journey to bring you back. That is the heart of the pastor. Now, if your heart is not like that, if someone has left your ministry and you, you don't see them for a couple of weeks and you've set nothing in place to make sure that they're okay, you've not had hospitality or somebody to call them and to just say, hey, we love you. Not, not, we're missing your tides this week. Not, oh, I know you went out of town, but um, I know you're going to leave your tithes, right? No, but I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about your soul. I'm concerned about your spirit. I'm concerned about your brokenness. I'm concerned about the mind battles that you deal with. I'm concerned about your children going astray. I'm concerned about you, your foreclosure on your house. I'm concerned about the repossession of your car. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. That's what God is expecting. And so what this is saying is they haven't healed. They haven't ministered to the hurt of the sheep. When the sheep have been given to you as a pastor, your responsibility is not to just preach on every Sunday. Your job is not to just teach on every Wednesday. That is not your job. Let me tell you something. God has given the greater amount of endowment of his spirit to the teacher. So guess what? If you have a teacher in your house, release them. Let them teach. And you be the shepherd. And you be the shepherd that goes out. After them, the one that intercedes on their behalf, the one that calls them up in the midnight hour and say, I've seen where you're going. God has shown me and I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you that your faith fail you not. And we are here for you and we're going to love you through it. You're not cast away. That's what I'm saying. We're going to minister to you. We're going to pray for you. So literally your role as pastor is not just to preach a good sermon on Sunday. Oh Lord, I preached a good sermon. Who have you saved? Who have you snatched out of the pit of hell? What sheep have you grabbed and cleaned the muck and dirt and myrrh and, and, and you know what I'm saying? And feces off of. What sheep have you done that to? Who have you fed? Who have you clothed? Who have you protected? Right? If you've not done that, then you've not really been a pastor. I'm telling you the truth. If your job is to sit up there and look good on Sunday in your suit or your dress, to be honored and to be lifted up high and you are not giving back, then you are not one that needs to give any honor. I'm just going to be real. Have you served yet? Have you served yet? Have you served your people? Your main responsibility as a pastor is to be a servant, to serve and to serve until you've got nothing left to serve and God will fill you back up. But if you've always got your hands out, what can I get? Let's do three anniversaries this year. And then we're going to be expecting you to give uh, every family. Now, listen, every family is going to get four hundred dollars this year. So you can just plan ahead. Every family give a certain amount. And, you know, this one, two, three, four, five families, they are out of work. They barely got a car and they've got children. And you're expecting them to do that. 
I don't know that God has ever required a particular amount from us ever. Has he? Has he ever said, I need you to give this exact amount every Sunday? This is what your expectation is from me, God. I don't, I don't know that God has done that. Y'all have to show me somewhere. So at the end of the day, when people sow into you for anniversary, they should sow as their heart leads them. As their heart leads them. Now, I'm not saying if your ministry is building, if your ministry is doing a conference, if your ministry is doing something, people are sowing into a vision. That is something completely different. But when you have expectations of them giving money to you directly, let me tell you, in services where people have set a particular amount that everyone needs to give to come, their offering is really low. But when they set up a conference and say, there's no payment, just come in as you are. Those offerings are overflowing because people give freely. Freely you've been given, so freely you give. So I'm saying, you know, when you set an amount, you're, you're putting pressure on people, breaking the backs of the people that they cannot come under from under the oppression. And so the Lord has an indictment. Okay, and it says, and you have not looked for the lost, but you have ruled them by power and without pity. You've placed your hand upon the sheep and pressed them down. Oppress them under a heavy yoke. And what does the Lord's word say? It says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It says his burden is easy. His, his burden is light. It's light. It's not this heavy thing upon the people expecting them to do so much. And the idea when I hear, okay, I want to get a helicopter. Then you get another job. You figure out a way to get a helicopter. And I'm looking at some people in the ministry who don't even have a car, who still are, are using their bus pass. And you got four cars. And now you want a helicopter or you want an airplane. And, and like... I'm riding my hoopty that I got to get under the hood and put the, put the thing together so that it works. Right now I'm in Ezekiel 34. And so, you know, I, I, I got to start it up by, you know, putting things together. I basically got to rub some sticks together to get my car to start. We got to push it, right? We got to push it and so it pops into place. But, but you find yourself saying, and I'm supposed to give how much a month so that you can get a, an airplane? Help me understand. Help me understand. For the place that I'm in. You know what I mean? So, okay. I go on. I move on. I digress. It says that in verse 5. This is 34 and 5. They went everywhere because they had no shepherd. Now listen. Here's the part that stands out. And they became food for every animal of the field. It says because there was no shepherd to protect them. To keep them. The ones who went astray. No, no shepherd. No pastor went out after them to get them and so because they went astray what happened they will pray for bigger animals so when we sometimes say, oh, these people left my ministry, uh, you know, they, you know, that's just because they weren't good tithers and, and they didn't want to tithe. And, uh, they left my ministry because they was offended by something. At the end of the day, your job is to suck it down. Your job is to suck it down. The Bible says that have you even have you suffered so much that you have dripped blood? That's Jesus. Have you suffered so much from what people have done to you, pastors? Have you suffered so much that you drip blood? No, you haven't? Okay, then, then you've not suffered to the measure of Jesus. That's what we've got to measure things by. So yes, people are going to hurt you. People are going to leave. But at the end of the day, your job is to pour. Your job is to nurture. Your job is to protect and to guard them. Now listen, it doesn't say they got to love you back. Sheep are special animals, right? And people say sheep are dumb. I'm not going to say that. Sheep are special animals. Sheep will run the wrong direction. They'll trip over stuff. They'll go into mud. They'll fall out. They'll go this direction. I know sheep are, I'm not going to say that though. Sheep will run off the side of a, of a cliff just because something in front of them was going that direction, right? If you don't corral them in, sheep will go astray. They will go astray. But we can't look and say, look at all those sheep out there in the world. Those who used to be believers who are now living a different kind of life. Yes, that's true. Now who are living a different kind of life. Now they used to be saved. Now look at them. They have fallen away. They are backslidden. We can't say that if we are part of the reason why they left in the first place. I'm going to just let that sit for a second. 
if we are part of the reason, if part of the reason why they left is because assessment was too heavy and because there was more weight and oppression upon them. It was because at the time I tried to make a phone call to see the pastor, I had to go through his secretary and then through the under shepherd and through the, the secretary secretary. And then I had to get on the calendar and then I had to make sure that my tithing record was okay. And then, and then they had to check and see if, you know what I'm saying? If I had to go through all of that just to get to the pastor. And then the person decided to leave. That's our fault. That's our bad, our responsibility. So lastly, in verse seven, it says, so you shepherds hear the word of God. As I live, says the Lord God, my flock has been killed and become food for wild animals because they had no shepherd. My shepherds did not look for my flock. They fed themselves, but have not fed my flock. At the end of the day, it's saying that the shepherds have fed themselves, have become fat upon the word, have expected lucre from people, have expectations more from people than they're willing to give. Now listen, if it's follow the leader, I need to see you. I need to see you first. If you want me to honor, I need to see you honoring people. If I, if you say you want me to give, I need to see you giving. I need to see you sowing. I need to see you ministering. You want me to do these things? Follow the leader. Sheep, like someone said, I won't say they're dumb, but sheep follow the leader. Sheep follow the leader. Who's ever in front, the sheep is going to follow who's ever in front. That's what sheep do. So if you're not setting a good example, then the sheep don't know what to do. It's our responsibility. This indictment is against the pastors. Our responsibility. My God. In verse 10, the Lord God says, I'm against the shepherds. It says, and I will ask them for my sheep. Now listen. Now this is where it, it may hurt some people. It says, I will stop them from feeding the sheep so that they will no longer be able to feed themselves. It says, I will save my sheep from their mouth so that they will no longer be able to be food for them. And what it's saying is this. The, the indictment against the pastor, against the shepherd. Now, what the Lord is saying for those of you who are not feeding the sheep, who have become so, so big on titles and accolades and wanting higher levels and Yes, I know. Bless you, honey. Who who have who have sought higher office, who sought to call yourself an apostle, who sought to call yourself this, that and the other call. I'm going to be called, you know, a prophet now. And even though my real office is a, a pastor and that is where God has given me a greater measure of my endowment, I'm going to call myself a, a prophet. And that's what I'm going to step into. Those of you who've done that, the Lord said, fine, but now I'm going to take my sheep from you. Now you won't have any. And now you won't get rich off of them. Now you won't get fat off of them. Now they're not going to just be sowing into you. I'm going to take them from you. God is raising up a remnant in this hour. Let me tell you. Let me just take a second. I'm going to prophesy for a second here. God is raising up men and women of God who have not been accepted by the norm, who've not been a part of the establishment, who've not been seeped in traditionalism, who've not been, been heaped upon pressure and oppression of the world, who've not caught up in com commercialism, who are not caught up in capitalism, who could care less about your money, but who are about the word of God. The kingdom is being advanced by those who've been misaligned, who've been misfits, who've been miscast, who wear tattoos, who have piercings. Are you hearing me? Those who don't look like everybody else, those who wear jeans in the pulpit, those who have mohawks. Are you hearing me? The Lord is raising up those who said, I will do your will. I will do it. I will feed your sheep. Yes, Lord, I love you. I will feed your sheep. I will tend your field. God is raising them up. And he's beginning to set one down and raise another up. He's getting ready to do it. I'm telling you, in this hour, you're going to see God raise up men and women of God, pastors in this hour that nobody heard of. Nobody knew. And people are going to say, what's their lineage? Where'd you come from? Where were you trained? And where'd you go to school? And how long have you been preaching? How long have you been teaching? I'm telling you, it's happening. It's happening. Because listen, the lost and that white ripe feel of harvest, it is getting bigger. It is getting bigger. And God said, I, I can't wait for you. You shepherds who are feeding yourself, getting fat off of my land, who, who, who are putting on the wool. You're shearing the sheep, taking the wool off of them, 
which will clothe them and you're putting it on your back. You're being exalted and lifted up. It reminds me, oh my Lord, it reminds me of Eli, so fat, so fat, fell off his chair, Kid broke his neck. Are you hearing me? Getting so fat off of people. But the Lord said, that's okay, I got an answer. I'm raising up a remnant. I'm raising up those who've not been churched. They've not been churched. They've not been churched. They've not been churched. The Holy Ghost has not been churched out of them. They're so full of the Spirit of God. When they open their mouth, prophetic words just flow. They're being raised up in this hour. They don't know protocol. They said, you, oh, you tormented by a demon? Come out. And someone said, you can't do that right in the middle of, of the domain. You can't do deliverance in the middle of the domain. No, come out now. Yes, James, they don't know the learned behavior. They don't know that you got to, ah, I'm leaning. They don't know any of that. They don't know that the women can't stand really in the pulpit, that she's supposed to be down on the floor, right? They don't know any of that, that you're not really supposed to wear pants at church. They don't know any of that. All they know is Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and risen. That's all they know. And that's what they come with. They say, hey, silver and gold, we ain't got none of that. I ain't got the baddest car. You know, I ain't, I ain't got the nicest clothes. But you know what I have? I have the authority of Jesus Christ. And right now, be set free. Be set free. And that's what God is raising up in this hour. Okay. So, the other thing. I can give you all these scriptures. I'm going to flow into something else. Let me share with you the other scriptures, Acts 20, 28 through 35. One of the things it says is, yes, I know that when I'm gone, hungry wolves will come in among you. This is Paul. And he's saying, this is what's happening. Keep a careful watch over yourselves, over the church. He was admonishing leaders. Be careful over the church. He says, the Lord has bought this with his own blood. Feed and care for the church of God, which means care for the sheep. He's saying that hungry wolves are going to come in among you. And what he says in verse 32, this really blesses me. He says, um, he, he talks about, I, I give you to God and I'm going to give you the word of, of his love. But in 33, he says, I have not tried to get anyone's money or clothes. He says, you all know that these hands worked for what I needed and for what those with me needed. Now, listen, he is saying, you know, as the, he's an apostle, right? But the pastoral call upon him when he was planting churches, he says, I was not trying to get money. From any of you. I was not trying to get money or clothing from you. The Lord said to go with whatever you have. Go take just what you have, right? And, and at the end of the day, you know, you're worthy of your hire. People will sow into you. Let me just, let me just put a, a thumbtack there. People will sow into you because of the revelation that God has placed upon your life. People will sow into you because they see the value of God coming out of you. They will sow into you freely because of what God has placed on the inside of you. So spending much more time in the presence of God so you can have his power and authority. Yes, you don't even have to ask. People will just sow into you. Because they see the power and the authority of God upon your life. You don't have to hold your hand out. You don't have to have an expectation. At the end of the day, if I and I and I know I say this and people say, DeAndre, don't say that. If I never get paid, if I visit a ministry and God moves and delivers and sets free and I never get paid, it's okay. God has got me. He's gonna make sure that I am I that I am restored. He's gonna make sure that whatever is pushed out is gonna come back to me. At the end of the day, honorary honorariums and all of this stuff gets so crazy because I can't put a price on the anointing upon my life. And listen, when I go into a house in the Lord has called me to preach a word. I don't know how he's going to use me. He might say, DeAndrea, I want you to be the prophet today. Okay. All right. I'll flow in the prophetic. God says, no, no. I need you to be a teacher today. Break down my word for the people. Okay, Lord. And the Lord say, no, in this house, they need a touch from a pastor. Give them a nurturing word. Give them a word that's going to build them up. That's going to guard their hearts and spirits. That's going to help them to feel fulfilled. Feed them today. So God might say any one of those things. And so literally you can't put a price on, on the gift of God. And this is not about great men and women of God who have thousands of ministries. And I don't care if you got 50 million followers at the end of the day, you can't put a price on the anointing. And listen, 
I, I said this once before. The anointing is the anointing. It is the same. The same anointing that rests upon Matthew Stevenson. That rests upon John Eckhart. And, and you know what I'm saying? And all of those people. We can name them for days. The same anointing is available for you. God will use you the same way if you are a yielded vessel. So we can't put a price on it. We can't say because I'm this name or that name, you need to pay me this amount. I think it's foolishness. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say that. It's foolishness. At the end of the day, God is going to make up the difference. All right. I'm digressing. Okay. <laughs> going aside. But I want you to know that Paul was making an indictment against the shepherds. He was saying, listen, this is what's going to happen. Your sheep will find themselves in a place where they will become food for wolves, that they will be picked off one by one. If we do not rebuild the hedge, listen, that is all of our responsibilities, not simply the pastor. To rebuild the hedge, the wall of protection, it is our responsibility. We guard the gate. We guard the gate. Can't anybody just come in here? Can't anybody just come in here and pick off the sheep one by one when we've raised up the hedge? But, but pastors have gotten off their watch. They've gotten off their watch. They're more concerned about building organizations and businesses and building up their fiefdom and their own kingdom. They're so busy, concerned about, you know, building up their name and, and all of this. And at the end of the day, they've not served one person. At the end of the day, now their sheep are, are thin and weak. I've met so many people lately who are in ministries. And at the end of the day, they have a leader. There's a leader. There's a leader in their church. Now you hear me say leader, right? There's a leader, but no pastor. The person who's leading the house is someone who's a prophet or someone even worse, who's a business person. They might have some gifting, some evangelistic call, but they're not a pastor. They're not a pastor. So when the people are like, we're not being fed, we're not being taught, we're not being trained up. And each Sunday we come, it becomes drudgery. It becomes work. Every Sunday we're setting up and we're building up and then we're tearing down the church and putting things away and we're doing all of this. But for what? We're not being fed. We're not being lifted. We're not being built up. So we're pouring out what we don't even have, that we've never received. And it, it, it vexes me, it hurts me to hear that you're in a house with a leader, but it's not a pastor. Not everybody's a pastor. Not everybody is in, the, is in a pastorship who God has said to you, you are a shepherd. And let me tell you, for those of you who are a pastor, you tell me if I'm wrong, tell me if I'm wrong. God said, I give you my heart. I give you my heart for the sheep. Those of you who are true and living pastors know that you wake up in the middle of the night sometimes crying for people. Your heart in you begins to hurt. You feel the burden of the Lord for the sheep, for the lost, for the broken. Am I right? Those of you who are pastors, God places that on the inside of you. God gives you his heart and then we build a business. God gives you his heart for his people and then we set assessments on folks. God gives you his heart and then you say, I need an extra anniversary this year. Your tithing is a bit low. God says, I give you my heart. I give you my heart. I give you my heart for my people. I give you my heart for them that you feel the burden. You hear their cries. And then we're so concerned about business as usual. There's a work for pastors to do. Yes, there's a work for teachers, evangelists, prophets, everybody else too. Amen. But there's a work for a pastor, for a shepherd. And we've been shirking our duty. More scripture. Jeremiah 23. I'm going to make it very clear to you. It says, what sorrow awaits the leaders of my people? This is New Living Translation. It says, oh, sorry guys. It says, the shepherds of my sheep. You have destroyed and scattered the very ones that were you were expected to care for. It says, therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to these shepherds. He says, instead of caring for my flock and leading them to safety, you have deserted them and driven them to destruction. It says, listen, now I will pour out judgment on you for the evil you have done to them. This is what's hitting the house right now. This has been hitting the house for the last five years, as a matter of fact. I know some of you know that there are pastors who are almost deathly ill. 
I'm not, don't name them. Don't name them. But you know some pastors right now who are on their sick bed. And they're young. They're on their sick bed. And it says, I will pour out my judgment on you for the evil you have done to them. It says, but I will gather together the remnant of my flock from the countries where I have driven them. I will bring them back to their own sheepfold and they will be fruitful and increase in number. It says, then listen, this is what I was telling you. Then I will appoint responsible shepherds who will care for them and they will never be afraid again. Not a single one will be lost or missing. I, the Lord has spoken. So this is what I'm talking about. God is raising up a remnant in this hour of leaders, of pastors, of shepherds who will guard and protect the sheep. Those who will make sure that the sheep are protected and that they will never be afraid again. But I know you are aware of some shepherds right now who are sick. They are ill. The judgment of the Lord is upon them because they have shirked their duties. I'm not saying everyone. I'm sure some people are, 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 are sick and they're afflicted for other reasons. But I'm telling you, this is what the Lord is showing me. The judgment has begun to hit the house. And it's been over the last five years or so that we've been seeing this because there has been such a misalignment. We have a lot of leaders who are in different places that God did not give them the, the grace to walk in. Yes, apostles can walk in all five offices, but there is a primary office that God has called them to initially where God has endowed them with great, great grace and great um, um, insight and revelation and authority. And not only that, God has given them the strength to do that office. They flow in it. It doesn't take extra work. But I'm sure apostles would say on here that some of the other office, though they flow in, it's not as comfortable. They flow in it. At the end of the day, they can do the job because God has empowered them to do it. But if they would be really so honest, they would say, but the primary office he called me to was this. And that is where the greatest, greatest measure of grace is for me. And I believe that to be so. Okay. And it says, not one will be lost or missing. And so this is the part where I get ready to transition for those of you pastors who are like, okay, ouch, 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 amen. We've got to get back on track. We can repent right now and say, God, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, for shirking our responsibility. Forgive us, Lord, for looking past what you've called us to do, for causing ourselves to be so tied up in so many other structures, so many other things, so many other responsibilities, and not looking at the main thing you've called us to do, which is to guard your sheep. God, we're going to come back to our first love, like in Revelations. He has it against the, the church of Ephesus. And come back to your first love, your first love, which is the ministry that Lord poured on down on the inside of you when he first called you to the kingdom. Go back to your first love. And Lord, I love your sheep. Lord, I want to serve your sheep. That is my greatest joy is to serve your people. That is my greatest desire. Lord, realign me with your vision. Realign me with how I can serve your people better. How I can serve the sheep that you've given me Lord better that I might present them to you without spot or blemish that not one will be lost let's go back to that so now I, I shift over to where people say okay we recognize that there is a responsibility of the sheep to the shepherd and I need to say this so this is the second half there's a responsibility and there is a responsibility of the sheep to the shepherd. There is. There is. There's two things I want to say. I'm going to start with Ezekiel. I was really going to read something else, but I, I, I need to say this first. Ezekiel 34, same area. So we see this indictment first against the shepherd. The Lord parcels that out and makes it very clear. They're responsible for what's going on with the sheep. Now, Ezekiel 34, 17 through 22 begins an indictment against the sheep to one another. So sheep, we have a responsibility in the house of God. It says, as for you, my flock, now the Lord is speaking to the sheep. He says, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. Is it not enough for you to eat in the good field? Must you crush underfoot the rest of your fields? And what this is saying is that there are sheep who find themselves getting fat off the word and, and not letting anybody else get what they need. So they find themselves being exalted and lifted up in their position, right? They're like, I, I'm, the, I'm the favorite of the pastor. I'm in this position and you're not anybody. You sit over there and, you know, I need to be in the spotlight. There's all of that that's going on. So I'm enjoying all of this good stuff for me, but I don't want to share it for anybody else. It says, 
Must my flock eat what you have crushed with your feet? Is it, is it not enough for you to drink of the clear waters? Must your feet fill the rest with mud? So the Lord is saying that we've taken what God has given, the, the, the pasture and the field and the place that he's called you to rise up in, and we have actually thrown it out. We've not respected, we've not honored what he's given us. So some of the houses we've been at, and let me say this, if the place that you're in is not Bible believing, if it is not moving in signs and wonders, if it is not fivefold, if it's not kingdom advancing, then perhaps you need to seek God about where you need to be. If you find yourself in a house where you say, I'm not giving them my tithes, I don't know what they're doing with it, then you don't need to be in that house. You don't need to be there. If you can't help and sow into the vision to help to support the ministry, then perhaps there needs to be another place that you should go. So the Lord said, I'm going to judge between the fat sheep and the weak sheep. It says, because you push with your side and shoulder, you run against all the weak ones. So it's saying that the, the new sheep that come in, the ones that are fresh off the street, you're sowing in, in, in discord. You're saying, yeah, you know, the pastor, you know, he was caught in adultery a few years ago. Though he's been restored, you share that with a new member. Or you heard people say things like, oh, you know, well, I don't know what they really do with the money. You see, you know, the cars that they drive and everything, sowing discord. It's saying you push with your side and shoulder and you run against all the weak ones and you've driven them away. So some sheep in a house are driving new converts away. They look at them and say, you got a mohawk. That's inappropriate. Your top is too short. That's inappropriate. Your skirt is too short. I don't know why you're coming up in church like that. I, I, from what I've learned, uh, the house of God is like a hospital. It's for sick people, for people who need to get well. So at the end of the day, we need to let anybody in and everybody in who wants to come. Lastly, I share this with you. Hebrews 13 and 17. It says, be, you got skinty jeans on, yes. It says, be responsible, be responsive to your pastoral leaders. This is Hebrews 13, 17 and 21. It says, listen to their counsel. It says, they are alert to the condition of your lives and work under the strict supervision of God. It says, contribute to the joy of their leadership. Now, this is the message version. I love it. It says, not to its drudgery. Our responsibility as sheep and those who are who are covered by pastoral leaders is to make the job of shepherding us a joy. It says, why would you want to make things harder for them? It says, pray for us. We have no doubts about what we're doing or why, but it's hard going and we need your prayers. All we care about is living well before God, the true shepherds of God, the true men and women of God who've been called as pastors, who've been raised up as shepherds, who are part of that fivefold office, who God has laid authority at their feet. They want, they want your prayers. They need your prayers. They need that honestly, even more than your money. Let me say that there's nothing like favor. There's nothing like favor. Favor will, 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 will beat wealth any day. Favor will give you open doors so you don't have to get out your money. So we would rather have your prayers at the end of the day. It's great that you tithe. It's great that you give offering. It's great that you do that. And that's important to the building up of God's work and making sure lights are on and making sure, right, the bathroom works and all of that stuff. That's important too. But at the end of the day, your prayers are mostly needed. Pastors are under attack. They're under attack. There are pressures to be something that they're not. And let me say this. I'm so blessed to be in the office of a pastor. I'm so blessed to be in that office. Yes, I said, yes, I flow in the prophetic. Yes, I, I'm in the office of a teacher too. Yes, no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, where my heart is, is where my treasure is, which is where I am with being a pastor. That is what God has placed on the inside of me. And so my, my charge to you pastors in this season is to allow the greatest endowment of the gift that God has placed on the inside of you to be activated and to come forth, not to apologize for the office that God has placed you in. If he's called you a pastor, there is still work yet for you to do. And even more so now today, because many are falling astray. Many are been uh, devoured by the enemy because they have no covering. They have no guard. They have no one who is watching over their soul. At the end of the day, that is not 
not the responsibility of the apostle. It is not the responsibility of the prophet. It is not the responsibility of the evangelist. Pastors guard. We protect. We water the sheep. We feed the sheep. We protect the sheep. We shear and clean the sheep. We have that responsibility. God has given us the greater measure. The greater measure is the life of a believer. That is more important than anything. The life of the believer. And he's given it to you, the pastor. So I say to you, please, I plead with you, please repent for where you have been. Seek the Lord about what he's told you to do. Go back to the drawing board. Go back to your first love. Go back to where you can be excited about serving people. Giving to people. Yes, I know there have been daggers and darts in your back. Yes, I know that people have talked about you. Yes, I know that they have torn you down. But at the end of the day, if you've not suffered as much that blood has dripped from your head, then you've not suffered to the measure of Jesus. There's more work to be done. And you know that God gives the increase. So it's 756. That is my time tonight. I wanted to share this with you. I know it was a bit of a rebuke, but I can do that. It's sort of like um, in your family, you may talk about your sister all day long, but if somebody else talks about her, you're going to go off. So since I'm in the office, I have a right to talk about my office and to talk about those who are in it to make sure that we are not, um, we are not sidelining in our faith. We are not sidelining in our responsibility and our duty that we are truly apprehending the promises of God, that we're helping people to become who God intends for them to be. So let me know, was this a blessing? Did you guys get something from this? Were you encouraged? Will you who are there pray for your pastors? Will you encourage them? Thank you. It's offering, I guess. Thank you, James. <laughs> My husband, bless you. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Ty. Bless you. I know. Isn't he? <laughs> Bless God. That's hilarious to me. All right, guys. So was this helpful? Do you guys think this was due? Let me know. I want to hear from you. Was I out of line? Talk to me. Did I give you word? Thank you. Bless you, Bettina. Bless you, daughter. Thank you, Cooley. Bless you. Bless you, Apostle. Bless you. Thank you, single mommy. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. So that is it. That is it for tonight. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you for those who chimed in. I thank you for watching those who watch the replay. God bless you. I pray that you'll be um, impacted by this word. I pray that the Lord will have you um, have greater compassion for your pastors, understanding who they are. And in this season, God is raising them up in the houses that are covered by apostles. Let me just say, they God has given them a measure of grace for it. But at the end of the day, they are going to have to go and fly. They are eagles. They are called to plant. They're called to build up. They're called to destroy. And, and many places and so God has to raise up pastors in the house let's not get so caught up on titles let's let's thank you James let's not forget that God is raising them up that every joint must give supply that it is not a hierarchy here that truly I believe that God has called us to be level the idea is that even with the fivefold gifts it's not one higher than the other it's truly about the gift the endowment of the gifts that each and every one is level. And so I even speak to those who are teachers now. Do not be ashamed of your calling. If you are called to be a teacher, if God has you unfold his word with revelation, please come forth. I beg of you, come forth. Begin to share. Begin to teach deeply so that people get revelation and they can grow. It is your job to ground us. Teachers, ground us in the word. It is your responsibility to help ground us. And so, yes, as a pastor and as a teacher, that is my gift. I can do both. But literally, God has called us to do this. He's called you into an office. He's called you into a place. And make sure that you're apprehending every bit of it and utilizing it to its fullest potential. 
You know, we have a great responsibility, but I tell you, the kingdom is advancing. It is advancing. And those who God is raising up in this hour don't look like everybody else. And I'm excited. I'm excited about it. I'm excited for the misfits and miscast. It reminds me of that cartoon <laughs> where you see the toys, the mi misfit toys, you know, they're missing an arm and leg and something's quite not quite right with the toys. <laughs> they're not the toys that any kid wanted. Right. But at the end of the day, they they were a team. So I say that the Lord is raising up. He's raising up in this hour those who've been cast aside and he's going to use the foolish things to confound the wise. So bless you. Thank you for joining me. I, I know I'll see you again. Thanks for sharing this Tuesday night with me. God bless you. Bless you all, Father. I pray right now that this word is sealed, Lord. Lord, that we are convicted in the places where we need to. God, we are encouraged in the places where we need to. Lord, that we will impact this nation. We'll impact the kingdom. We'll impact this world for you in the name of Jesus. We will take our charge. We will put our hand to the plow. We will do the work of the ministry, Lord. We will lift up one another in prayer. We will pray to cover and to protect our leaders but God at the same time those who have been who have been in the wrong place at the wrong time God you apply correction you allow every crooked place to be made straight every high thing to be made low and God you re you reveal who are your sons and daughters you reveal in this hour who you're raising up God empower them let miracle signs and wonder follow those who you're raising up in this area direct their path Order their steps, God. Lead them, Lord, into the place that you've called them to be. May they be set as lights upon a hill, that they may draw many to you in the name of Jesus. God, we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed. You're already blessed. It's not, you know, the, let the word, you know, bless the hearers. The word is already blessed. You are already blessed and whom the Lord has already blessed cannot be cursed cannot be cursed. So you are blessed. So enjoy your evening. I love you all and I will see you again. Thanks guys. Thank you.